Anything that I ever ever heard before, and more than I could have expected. I expected a lot, but I'm thinking if this brings some business her way, that would be Atlanta, fantastic. What because a great people, place to start! Let's, yeah, people let's need jump to right hear her it. performance. <laughs> yeah, you can't be giving kudos to Susan before we like you know get Susan. started. Jump in. Hey, welcome to the Protectors Podcast. Two excellent, well, three if you want to count. Aya Madeira, Ama, Ama. We were just talking about her name before. It's like we always get our names always mixed up. I'm finally it's Ama Madeira. But uh, Lanny Beach and Suzanne Elise Freeman, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. You know, we were talking like right before we came online about a strong female protagonist. And Ama knows this very well. It's like there's a new market out there for it. I shouldn't say it's a new market, but a solid market. There are so many strong characters out there that are female that need to be brought to the written word, but not just the written word, but the audio. <laughs> so let's talk about the audio version and, and getting that strong voice around it. And like, to me, I'm an audio book person. I am always like, whenever I'm, I'm working out or driving countless hours, I'm always listening to audio books. So this relationship started and now Suzanne, you're boom. Yeah. You're it. I know that was, it was shocking to me to um, be included in one of, I mean, at, by name in one of Landon's books that Scott narrated. Um, and in fact, I just, I started listening to it recently and heard Susanna Lee's Freeman. I'm like, I knew it was coming. Didn't exactly know when, but it was still a shock. Um, yeah. So Scott and, and Landon started talking about um, writing the actual book within the book. I don't know how much you guys have discussed here on nights um, or here on breeze, which, which one is it? That's yeah. Both of them. Okay. Um, the, the Huron, what is it? The, what's the series called? Trilogy. Yeah. The sunrise side mystery series. Okay. Probably should have had that memorized before we started. Um, <laughs> but uh, so that is about an author, a female author who's writing a, a female protagonist and um, she's writing all these books. So they started talking about doing a book within a book. And Lan is like, that's a great idea. Maybe I should do a novella and have Suzanne narrate it. And I'm like, I'm sure that'd be great. And then it turned into this full length, giant origin story of, of, a, of, an, of an assassin and spy. And yeah, it, it couldn't have been more thrilling. Wait, wait, wait. So yeah. let, let me make sure I get this right. So Landon, you wrote a series of books that had a fictional character who's an author, right? Tracking so far? And then that fictional character was named after Suzanne? Close. So what I did was I was writing my Great Lakes saga. I'm originally from Michigan. I live in Florida Couldn't now. tell at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why I'm wearing a Tigers hat and not a Michigan hat right now. They're in a little bit of trouble in football right now <laughs> as we speak. So... Um, but still go blue. I, I hope things work out for the best. Um, in terms of what you were asking, yeah, I was four books into that saga and they're all standalones and each one takes place on a different Great Lake and they're mixed genres too. Some are action adventures, some are thriller espionage, and then I've got a organized crime thriller. But then almost as a dare, a friend uh, said, I'll bet you can't write a murder mystery. And as we all know, probably the safest bet always in writing are murder mysteries. They never get old. You always have a built-in audience. People love them. I love them. They're fun to read. And also, too, it kind of goes along with my philosophy because I'm very much a standalone writer. I'm not anti-series. I just think I do my best work when I'm writing standalones. But when I thought about a murder mystery and a detective, that seemed like a place that I could probably still bring my energy to the page because let's be honest, uh, unless things go horribly, horribly wrong, uh, when you're a detective, you usually don't end after one job. <laughs> you know, you go, you solve another mystery. And so that lends itself really well to a series character. But I did want to have a beginning, a middle and an end. So I envisioned after I wrote the first one, uh, a trilogy. And it is about a writer who is this mythical novelist 
who has writer's block, but she disappeared for 10 years and nobody knows where she went. And then she emerges to write the fourth book in the saga. And by that point, Scott Brick had narrated uh, all of my novels and I knew him because a friendship uh, grew that he was dating Susanna Lee Freeman and she was an audiobook narrator. And I looked at her work and I'm like, my gosh, this is amazing. I was blown away by it. And I thought, you know, what would be fun to surprise him is sort of an inside joke. But I meant it in all actuality because I was impressed by her work. I said, I'll slide in that Suzanne is the narrator of this mythical book within the book, the series. And so he got to that point and he's like, he's like, my gosh, Suzanne's in here. <laughs> and so we went on and went on. And then I wrote Huron Nights, which is the sequel to Huron Breeze. And I always envisioned it as a trilogy. And the one that I'm almost finished with right now is Huron Sunrise. But at one point, I sat and thought, you know, I've never tried my hand at a pure action espionage novel. And wouldn't it be neat right before the final book in the trilogy comes out that you get to read one of Adrian's um, adventures and let's have Suzanne narrate it. Um, and so that right before you get, because the arc of the three books are, it's Rachel trying um, to beat writer's block by moonlighting as a private detective and nobody knows who she is. And when her journey mirrors Adrian's, and so just as that's about to all come together in Huron Sunrise, let's go back to the beginning and find out where Adrian started at because then it opened up all kinds of possibilities for here on sunrise. Cause I'm kind of writing Rachel's end, but I'm writing Adrian's end as well. And so that's where the whole idea came from. And Suzanne was game from day one. Thank God. <laughs> Landon, do you want to talk about the, uh, the coincidences and similarities between me and Adrian? <laughs> yes. And the major one that I would say he's an is, assassin for hire and <laughs> a clandestine organization that we're probably all going to get killed for even talking about. Right. Suzanne had only killed five people when I met her, <laughs> but no, um, you know, Suzanne has always been really big on physical fitness and we're both from up North. So we understand how it gets cold up in the winter. But the one thing I didn't know until afterwards was I was thinking, cause you know, both of you have written books. You know how it is. You're trying to differentiate yourself. You're trying to come up with something new that the audience hasn't seen before. And I thought, well, instead of a superhero or super agent or a military squad that are going to go on for book after, I was like, what if it was just the best athlete we possibly had and see what they could do in the field completely off the books and so I came up with, let's go with heptathletes and that they're recruited right out of college. So here I am patting myself on the back saying, wow, what a great original idea. Suzanne, she works out. We're good to go. And then she says, Landon, and this is, this is after the book is written and we're talking about recording it. She's like, you know that I was a heptathlete at the University of Minnesota, right? I'm like, what? You never said that. She's like, didn't we talk about this? I'm like, no. no I, I wasn't sure if we did because as Landon said, we had the pre-writing conference. Because yeah. he was like, you know, what do you want to see in this? What do you hate about when you, like when you read these types of books? What are the things, the tropes that you absolutely hate? Just various things. So I, it had been months. So I, I, it was very likely that I had forgotten that I mentioned that I was a heptathlete, but I was like, I don't remember talking about it. I don't talk about that a ton. It doesn't come up in conversation. And it was like, this would be a giant, awesome, great coincidence if if he just happened to be writing about heptathletes and I'm a heptathlete. So, yeah. That is no. fantastic. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, Landon, you're an indie writer. And, you know, Amy and I were talking about this. Amy's book uh, published this week. A new Congratulations. Game. A new game. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I wanted to say before I forget, one, from one fellow veteran uh, to two others, just thank you for your service. Uh, it's just great to be on here and to be a guest on your wonderful show. And for Ama, happy pub day today. I hope it just kills it. Well, I get to talk to you fine folks. So this is a great celebration, but thank you. And thank you for your service. Yeah, I appreciate you. you all. 
<laughs> thank everybody. Well, you know what? Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Now, you know, indie authors and, you know, that's one thing we were talking about before we hit the record button was that like, you know, if you're a big publishing house, you have the the same cast of characters who are always, you know, the, the big names out there. You get the Ray Porters and et cetera, you know, the really big, you know, but the big names, which also comes with a big price tag. Now, when you're an indie author, and this is one thing I've always been interested in, too, is like, how do you find the right narrator for your character? You know, it seems like when you're a big, you know, you got a big publishing house, you have like 10 different people saying, well, this narrator might be right fit for this character and, and et cetera. But how did you, I mean, granted, you guys have a personal relationship, but it also comes out to like, this is the perfect fit. So how did this whole, this, this all happen? And like, if you're an indie author, I really want you to give advice to other indie authors out there because this market is, it's a great market and there's so much material out there to get out there and have the right voice for it as well. So both of you guys really feel free to chime in. Well, I will begin by saying that I consider myself the luckiest author on earth <laughs> because I get to work with my dream narrator, which is of course, Scott. And then it's led me to Suzanne, which has been a dream as well, but it really did start with Scott. And to give a little bit of a backstory, um, when I was in the service um, and then I got out and started teaching, one thing that my family and I would always do, my wife and I would take a summer trip up to Michigan to visit family. And so we're going back now to the summer of 2007. And we always used to get audiobooks, but on CD, right? So uh, we'd either buy them or go to the library and get a couple books on CD to listen to together. Well, I was, you know, feeling like I had a little bit more money in my pocket as a teacher back then. And so I went to Borders, which is no longer with us. <laughs> and You're really dating all of us now. You know <laughs> this, right? And I got one of my favorite series, which is the King and Maxwell series by David Baldacci. And the third book had just come out called Simple Genius. And I had read the first two. So had my wife, just the hardcover. But we said, hey, let's listen to this on the way up. This would be perfect. It just came out. And so we got up early in the morning and we're driving north on good old I-75. It's straight shot from Florida all the way up to Michigan. You stay on 75. And literally, we had just crossed the Georgia border. We were listening to it. And I said, Mary, I, I said, stop, stop the book. She's like, what? <laughs> She's like, I want to keep going. I said, who is this? I said, who is narrating this book? I said, I'm in a trance here. This is incredible. And she turned over, you know, the cover. And I still have it to this day. And she says, some guy named Scott Brick. And I said, this guy is incredible. And then we listened to it and I became a Scott fan. Fast forward to... 2019. And I had three books out and they had placed in international writing competitions. And so we felt that we were in a place where we could expand our business. And she said, well, for audiobooks, who are, who are you thinking? And we had never talked about Scott since that day, other than when we would listen to an audiobook, we enjoyed it. And I said, do you remember that audiobook we listened to for David Baldacci's series? I said, Scott Brick. I said, it would be amazing. So I said, but there's a fat chance. I mean, he's a Hall of Fame narrator. I mean, he's Ray. I mean, when you started mentioning Ray Porter, I was like, all right, Jason, Scott Brick will be coming up next. <laughs> and so um, I looked on his website, though, and I found that he was working with a few indie authors, very few. And I said, hey, wow, yay me. Then I looked at online. I'm like, oh, great. They're million copy seller indies, <laughs> you know, people that got in when there was, you know, not as much competition and established their base and have tremendous work. And I, I, I have corresponded with one of those indies, really nice guy and fantastic stuff. But I said, well, I said, because of my resume and placing in those contests, I said, why not? And so I'll never forget it. I contacted his amazing manager, Gina Smith, her production manager, and she came back and said, send us the first book. Scott will read us this week and we'll see if we want to go forward. And I've never had a more nerve wracking week in my entire life than that week just waiting. 
And then the call came and it was better than I could have ever expected. They said, yeah, we're going to do a three book deal with you. And then we started, you know, a, a genuine friendship, which I treasure so much right now. It's wonderful working with him, not only as a professional, but as a friend. And then we just did every book after that, which eventually led to this perfect opportunity where I couldn't imagine anybody but Suzanne narrating the Blue Hour Sanction. So I apologize, Jason, for the length of that answer, but it's been a long road to be able to do this full time. So I don't shy away from that. I'm very blessed and happy. <laughs> okay, that was awesome. <laughs> I've got two two additions to that. Um, first of all, Ray Porter is going to be on my side in my bridal party for when Scott and I get married in December. He is my bridesman. Congratulations. Uh, he is wearing a custom kilt, which I can't freaking <laughs> wait. You sent me the inspiration. It's so cool. Uh, but also... Um, you know, indie authors, first of all, I guess if you don't have somebody in mind already, like you can reach out to Ray, you can reach out to Scott, you can reach out to anybody and see if they'll do the deal. They'll probably cost a lot more than, you know, a, the average narrator would. And I don't mean by average, I just mean, you know, somebody you don't consider to be on that level. Um, and some of them, you may never have heard of them and they still may charge an arm and a leg, but you can reach out to anybody like Landon had Scott in his head and he was just like, I'm going to go for it. That can happen anytime. A friend of mine. Um, and I mean, it happens that I have, you know, this relationship with Scott that gives other people access that they probably wouldn't have had otherwise. But a friend of mine reached out and said a friend of, you know, she said a friend of hers wrote a book wanted to get in an audio, wanted to get some advice. I said, no problem. So we got on the phone. He started talking to me about me doing it. And it was basically like, it was a business book, but it, in the beginning, it was his personal story. And I'm like, you don't want a woman to do that. Like as much as I appreciate the, uh, the thought that you want me to do it, I think a guy would be better. I can suggest many people to you. And in that moment, Scott walks in. I'm like, hey, honey. And he, we weren't on video. So, you know, he had no idea who I was talking to. And, um, and I said, actually, you know, my, my boyfriend at the time, my boyfriend, uh, is a narrator, but you know, he was probably a little out of your price range. He's like, really? Who's that? And I said, Scott Brick. And he, and, and I said, he said, what has he done? And I'm like, I mean, okay. But I, then I said, Scott, what are you working on today? And he goes, oh, then the latest Jason Bourne. And so the guy's like, I'm sorry, what? And then he goes, well, how much would he charge? And I said, honey, how much would you charge? He goes, I'll give him the friends and family rate, um, which turned out to be, frankly, a little too little given what ended up happening, which was fine. Everybody's happy and everybody's friends, but there were some some issues. Um, so, but the guy was just like, I'm sorry, Jason Bourne will be narrating my business book? So yes, so it just the point is, reach out, you never know. And if you if you have the budget for it, and I don't know how much you've discussed this in the past, but per unit, audiobooks sell and you will clear and have a profit of much more money. So you will make up that money pretty quickly as long as you're you know doing enough to sell them. Um, but yes, it, it might take a bigger budget, but go for it. Just reach out to the people that you're dreaming about. You know, the importance of an audio book, you brought it up. They, it's going to make the money back. It is. I equate audio books to me. It's, it's almost like I'm in a movie, but I'm in a movie for nine to 14 hours and I'm enjoying it. I feel like I'm in the scenes. I just finished uh, the sons of valor two, which is Andrews and Wilson and Ray Porter narrated that. And their next book comes out. And I think next week, week after, but it's like, I look forward. Like if you find a narrator, you really like, you're going to look at all their series so not only are you like, you know, people who are looking at like the Ray Porters are going to look at everything that he's doing because they love his voice. So if you find a narrator, so when you are an indie author and you get a solid narrator, you also might pick up other audiences that you never thought you would before. Absolutely. That is 100% true because so many listeners, they don't go to the author that they like best. They go to the narrator that they like the best. And that will 
that will open up the audience purely because they're like, oh, what else has they done? Has he done? What you know? Maybe Ray has done more of this person's books. And you're absolutely right. People will follow a narrator anywhere. I will. I'm I'm very very picky about the narrators I listen to. I will follow them strictly if I'm going to invest that much time. I want a narrator that I already know that I love, which is probably mean because I'm not giving newer narrators a chance. But I have a I have a genre. I have the narrators I'm dedicated to that I will buy anything that they that they make anything. And you're absolutely right that that will happen. Ray is one of those people. Now, out of curiosity, Suzanne, I mean, I know when I was selecting a narrator, it was really about the sound. So, you know, I submitted my little here's the audition piece and I had people submit sound bites back to me, which was so cool to get to audition narrators. But then when you're looking at things that you potentially want to pursue or do, like what what jumps out at you? What is it that kind of makes you choose one project over another? Well, at this point, for the most part, I don't seek out projects. Now I'm cast. So I work with publishers. Um, majority of my work is through publishers. And then the occasion where an indie author, which actually has happened a decent amount, um, because people will see my work in a certain genre and reach out and say, hey, I'm interested in you doing my book. What would it, that entail? And then I'll send them back my, my you know, my rate, um, the, the process. And, you know, then we can agree on working together. Um, so I don't really seek out work at this point. Um, I could be doing more of it, but um, I'm honestly too busy. Um, so right now, but the indie authors who get my attention more than anything are in the genres that I love to narrate, which are thrillers and mysteries and sci-fi and fantasy um, uh, and like paranormal, like there, I, I gravitate toward a certain thing that I listen to. And that's a lot of sci-fi and a lot of mystery and a lot of thriller. So those genres, I'm definitely going to perk up a lot more if somebody reaches out with that, with that genre. But um, yeah, so that's it. And obviously, you know, if it's well-written, but truthfully, if I have room in my schedule, I'm not Scott. Scott is Scott Brick. So Scott can really be choosy. He he does not need anybody's work. He does not need to take and I mean publishers reach out and he's like, yeah. I mean, eh. most of the time he's happy to take the work and it, with series especially like cuz he has so many major series that he does. But for me, honestly, if I have room in my schedule and you'll meet my rate, I'll probably do it. What goes into it? That's my question is what goes into an audiobook. I mean, do you go to a studio or you're in your house or you? Most of us, especially after COVID, but most of us, even before COVID had a home studio. So um, I, depending on if it's a publisher who works in studios, then they'll bring you in studio. There aren't a lot of people who are doing that nowadays anymore. Most of the time it's home studio. Um, even for major, major publishers who used to only do in studio work. Now, a lot of it's in home studio because of COVID. Um, so, walk, you know, Suzanne, walk me through, I'm, I've always been, cause like, I keep thinking, I'm like, okay, I had the mic, I have a, a nonfiction that's been out for years. I really want to do an audio book and I'm like, do I rent a studio or, and, and how do I, how do you read the book and, and not be like, um, uh, and like, you do, you, you do, you don't, you don't read straight through mm -hmm. you, 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 you. You go until you screw up, basically. I like that. You start right before when you screwed up and you keep going. And then you go back and start right before you screwed up again. And, you know, sometimes I have better days and sometimes I have worse days where an entire sentence is probably, you know, recorded in five different segments because I just can't get through it. And then there are times where it's been like, it's been three pages. I haven't screwed up. This is amazing. Um so, I mean, depending on what you're talking about, about the process, I'm happy to go into any detail about the process that you'd like, but um, it's, you know, having the right equipment, it's having the right sound, you know, soundproofing in your booth. It's um, having the right DAW, which is, I never remember what DAW stands for, but it's just your recording software. Um, a lot of people use Pro Tools. I use Reaper. So learning that system, because you are also your own audio engineer when you're doing this, which is another reason why we charge a little bit more than we used to. Um, because it's a lot of freaking work. 
Um, it's work. It's like real work. Yeah. It's not like, hey, you know what? I'm going to sit down and read a couple paragraphs. Yeah. You know, I remember back in the day I tried it. And, you know, this was in nowadays, I'm sure, with like AI and everything else, it would make it a lot better to edit it and stuff. Oh. Please well, I'm just thinking, like, oh, no, no, not AI like that. I mean, like, cleaning things up. Like, I so when I, I'm not a post production person. So, yeah, because with the, with the podcast, you'll find out, like, we could have like glitches and stuff now. And because I run it through the AI software, it takes on a lot of, lot of stuff in the backgrounds. And I remember trying to do the audiobook a few years ago. I mean, and the other thing is, I shouldn't say AI, I should say software has updated enough yes. to where, it, you could really pick up on like, you know, like <clears throat> clearing your throats and all the other stuff that I'm excited that, you know, not try it on my own, but maybe find someone with the right voice mm -hmm. who can be Jason Piccolo. Well, yes. Jason, I'll, I'll get self-promotional for 30 seconds and I'll say two. No, yeah, I want you in there. Here's the deals. I really want you to be self-promotional because we've, we've <laughs> talked a lot about voiceovers, but the blue hour sanction is like, I'm really looking forward to like listening, listening yeah, to it. We should yeah. talk about the book. It's a. It has nothing to do with the Blue Hour Sanction. Actually, it's two books ago. I wrote a book that I researched for a year and a half called Narrator, and it is uh, my love letter to storytelling. And it is a psychological thriller, but it also goes into all the things that you just asked about narration and it was a special project that Scott and I did together because until that point there had never been uh, an audiobook narrator who had been the protagonist of a fiction book set within the framework of a psychological thriller and so I still have people that love audiobooks and you're absolutely right one of the biggest things that came out of that is that there are cult-like followings where the people are like i go to bed with you every night i listen to you in the morning as i wake up and have my coffee and they will listen to anything by that narrator so it's a wonderful community it's the only part of the book business that has had double digit growth in the past 10 years and i think two years, years ago yeah, yeah it 74,000 audiobooks came out in a single year. So if you are going to try to make it for a living, being an author, it is almost essential now that you have that third leg of the stool where you've got your Kindle books, eBooks, um, paperback or hardcover, and you've got to have audiobooks because it is the only part of the book business that's growing. And if I can promote Landon a little bit more regarding narrator, um, First of all, it was dedicated to Scott. It was based on Scott. Uh, he again wrote a bunch of us into the book, which was super fun. But last year, um, the Audio Awards are the audiobook Oscars. And last year, Landon's book narrator and Scott were up for best male audiobook of the year. And that's a huge accomplishment for. Congratulations. Her but also just period. Like it is a major, major thing. And the, I mean, we all thought it was meant to be that it was gonna win. Um, <laughs> it did not, we were very disappointed. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was an absolutely beautiful ode to narrators and it, it, was, it was lovely and it just, I would highly recommend it to anyone. Well, speaking of beautiful odes to narrators, I mean, Landon, you actually put, you know, a dedication to Suzanne at the beginning of Blue Hour Sanction that, you know, she is the voice of Adrian Astra now and forever. That is, that is incredible. Yeah. That was, that was amazing to see. You know, Amo and Jason and Suzanne, of course, um, what I would say is that, you know, navigating this business and, um, trying to be able to do this full time for 19 years. I mean, I have more years of rejection than some people have rejection letters. And so when someone says, oh, my gosh, 45 rejection letters, it took me three years to make it. I'm like, try 19 years. All right. <laughs> and then come talk to me. But what I have found is that going forward and just working with wonderful people and professionals is that kindness goes a lot longer and farther than bitterness. And so when, you know, I never take anything for granted, you know, every audiobook with Scott and Suzanne is a big event, a big deal to me. And again, when I thought of her in this role, um, 
the fact that she would make time for me and perform this book and the relationship that we developed going through it, through that pre-writing conference to all of our emails back and forth and our pre-recording conferences, that stuff means something to me. And so uh, when I heard it, I said, yes, you know, I, I, I think I had in Huron Breeze that the moment with the book inside the book was when Ian Fleming looked at Sean Connery and he said, you are James Bond when he met him for the first time. And I had, I think it was, it was uh, the character, Rachel, her agent in the book who looked at Suzanne in a meeting and said, you are Adrian Astra. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a pleasure to dedicate both of those books. And I think you both know as authors that it's a big thing because we don't know how many books we're going to write. You know, I'm not all about writing and publishing glorified first drafts in two or three months. I'm about going through the entire process and trying to put out stuff uh, that I'm behind and I believe in. And so there are obviously fewer books, but at the same time, you really have to pay attention to who you're going to dedicate it to because it's kind of forever. Um, and so, no, I don't look back on that at all. I'm just tickled. <laughs> can I can I jump into um, so? In in Scott in narrator, he dedicated it to Scott, and Scott felt uncomfortable narrating to Scott and like the the love letter really that Landon wrote to him. So he had Ray Porter read the credits. Oh, that's awesome! And so he had it. He had him do it. So that part of the book, Ray Porter does the credits and um and the and the dedication. And um, Ray thought it would be funnier if Landon were to have written something just ridiculously insulting. So Ray himself came up with something that is the funniest thing you will ever hear ever, but could not possibly be shared on anything family friendly. Because it was foul and poetic. <laughs> yeah. So, but because Scott did that with Ray, I asked Scott to narrate my credits. So he, he's the one who wrote, he read the dedication. Now, Suzanne, you know, yeah, we have Landon's book coming up, but what else can we find you in? Oh gosh. Um I mean, let's give like the the top the top highlights, the one you really okay. like really proud of. You got to mention the Cronin book, Suzanne. Yeah, yeah. That is Um Scott and I narrated together um the most recent Justin Cronin book, The Ferryman. Um that was amazing and astonishing the experience was amazing because I got to be directed by this woman that is kind of a legendary director that like you know, the elite get to be directed by her. And I happen to be in this book. So I got to be directed by her mostly because she was going to direct Scott. Scott works with a lot of people, but he really loves working with her. Um, so it was, it was a wonderful experience overall. We got to meet Justin on a tour stop of his and do a reading in one of his tour stops. Um, Scott and I, this is not a Scott and Suzanne like highlight film, but Scott and I narrated a book together last year um, that actually won the Audi for science fiction this year um, in March. So that was amazing. It was my first time being nominated. Scott's won, been nominated a million times, won a million times because he's Scott Brick. Uh, I had not been nominated. It was the last thing in the world that I expected for us to win because there were some serious heavy hitters in our category. And I was like, you know, I, I don't know how we got nominated, but we got nominated. Great. I'm at the party. Wonderful. I get to wear a medallion for the nominee. And when they read our name, I, I completely blacked out. And that's called Intergalactic Exterminators, Inc. Um, I know. I'm looking through your um, your Amazon. So everybody, when you want to look for books, you know, you look for like, I'll look up Hey Landon Beach. And if you always look for the audio, you can see there's two other areas in there, you know, one or two other people that might be contributors, including audio books. So, if, you know, it's easier to look on Audible if you're going to look for hey, it. Come on, <laughs> you know, come on, give me a break. <laughs> I know. Okay. I love, I just, no, I love, for you your know, listeners, for your I, I, that's why I was so excited about this, this talk today is because like, I get so many physical copies of books. I love them. I love having, I love having a book, but you know, between like life and kids and, and all the other things, you could put the audio book in when you're chilling and you can listen to it. And, like I said, it feels like you're in a movie and like that voice, it's like the soothing voice of Suzanne Elise Freeman or Scott Brick or Ray Porter. But it's like, it's just, it's something about the audiobooks, and I, I love it. Yeah. And you know, I man, I'm a fledgling 
fiction writer now. I mean, my whole life has been nonfiction. And now when I listen to these really? books, these Major? characters, <laughs> my whole life's been nonfiction, I think. I don't even know where I'm at anymore. I'm 50. Oh, so, you got another one in you, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I got another career left in me. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm really excited about this, about the audio books and like, it is really a process. So when you're, when you're writing these books and when you're putting it down on paper, you start thinking about the narration and, you know, I start thinking about like, you know, the Ray Porter has like the five different voices, like the, the girl voice, the, the Slavic voices and everything else. And I'm like, I'm excited to think about the audio book version. And, you know, if I go the traditional route or the indie route or self, at least having that option of having a solid audio book out there. And like, like, like you said, reach out to these authors. Sometimes it's worth the investment if you want to get a good return. The narrators. Yeah. Um, and if I can, if I can offer up some advice that narrators give whenever we, whenever we're doing panels with authors who are interested in producing audiobooks, read every word of your book out loud, not to narrate it, but to hear it and see if it makes sense coming out. See if that, those, Two words should be a contraction to make it more natural, um, not necessarily maybe in the narrative, but in dialogue. So like, you know, it's it's amazing what happens when an author reads their work out loud and they realize, oh, God, I have no idea where that sentence was going. Like, maybe I should rework that or maybe I should put in a comma or something. Because, you know, we'll have a paragraph that we're sitting in front of with no breaks, no periods, no nothing. We're like, I have no idea how to put all of that in a string of words together to record that and make it make sense. So we've we've talked to a lot of authors who say, when I read it out loud, that's when I realize, oh, like if you really care about the audio version, because a lot of people will skim over things in their in their minds and their brains will make connections that may not be there because they're not looking at every single word. They're just grabbing the entire sentence all at one time. But when somebody has to like read every word of that out loud, it it's a different thing. So so that's that's the advice we always we always give out just to make our lives easier, but also to make your book like more understandable and more and easier for a, a reader to understand. That's actually a huge thing you can do with just editing in general. So bravo, get it from somebody else. Because I know I've gone to battle with my editor, which she's amazing. She's probably cursing at me right now that I said something not that she, you're a goddess. I love you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, but, you know, there's been a few times where I've gotten some notes back about especially dialogue they're, they're, where they change the flow of it. And I'll be like, no, nope, reject, reject. And that's kind of what I had. I read it out loud because I'm like, this just doesn't sound right. Thinking about somebody actually reading it in the future. And it helps so much. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Now, when it comes to Blue Hour Sanction, I mean, you know, you've been doing a lot of kind of murder mysteries and things like that. This is not a murder mystery. This is like straight up old school. You you get the feel of like the, that classic, like Blofeld guy with a cat, super villain. I mean, it, everything is very grandiose. It's very larger than life. It is, it is, it, the, the, you got super villains. So these are like classic uber villains. And then you have Adrian Astra going through this very unconventional um, training and workup cycle. Let's call it that. <laughs> yeah. So when I thought about what would be the story to tell, that readers who were fans of the series that would be like, oh, because it's a six book series that Rachel is writing in the books. And I thought, I don't want to give any of those because I want to kind of keep those pristine. And so I said, but what if it was an origin story? And I've never written an origin story before. And it's always interested me as a storyteller of how someone becomes who they become. And how you can have someone who is an ordinary person from a blue collar background who becomes the world's most lethal assassin. And so even in speaking of um, the audiobook terms, I cannot wait for both of you to hear Suzanne's Richard Burton. I mean, they're, they're, you want to talk about challenging a, a narrator to bring out her best and to take on that character it's incredible. It's amazing. Um, and it's subtle too. And as Scott has always said, subtlety in audiobooks plays, but she did not shy away from it. And the book is so much better because of the attention that she gave. And then 
I'm another favorite character of mine in there. I've just got to say, you know, Raven, the the director, um, somehow every time I heard Raven performed by Suzanne, I got scared. I'm like, I don't want to be in trouble with her. <laughs> it was just really powerful. So, you know, back to your original question there, Emma, it was the Hunger Games-like scenario. I thought that would be something that would challenge the candidates physically and mentally. And it was something that people hadn't seen before in this genre at all. And the grandiose and, you know, the style and class of Switzerland and the jet set lifestyle, that's kind of what you want. I, I wanted to go big because, again, I wasn't probably going to touch this again. So I wanted to get it all into one book and everybody else kind of think for the rest of their life. Well, I wonder whatever happened to, to Adrian. And it's weird because two days ago I wrote her final chapter. So a part of Huron Sunrise, it gets right toward the end of the book in part three. It's Adrian Astra's final chapter. And what's going to be cool about that is that fans will know how it ends. And Suzanne and Scott are co-narrating the book. And so they will get to hear Suzanne perform Adrian one last time in that chapter. Uh, and then Scott will narrate other chunks of it because he's the narrator for the regular series. But anyway, you know, for both of you to even read the Blue Hour Sanction um, and, you know, in the blurbs that you gave me were so kind. I'm glad that you liked it. Um, it was the most difficult book I've ever written because I have never written action before. And it is difficult. Mm -hmm. Writing action is so hard. Because, I mean, it's easy to write, but like, oh, grenade going off here, you know, gun here. <laughs> but to make it really suspenseful, um, I was worn out <laughs> after writing this. I, I don't know if I'll write another action novel. It was tough. I say, but it's worth it. And you know, I guess you know, it, it's not going to be for everybody. This genre, like in these stories, aren't for everybody. But you probably should warn everybody that this is it gets intense. And that's coming from somebody who really likes it when things get intense. There are parts that I, I was reading. I was like, holy crap. Um, but it is, it is very grandiose. And it is unquestioning that you are a fan of Michigan and the Upper Peninsula in particular because, man, is it dripping from every single page. So for those of us who are Buckeyes, ah. it's like we're all big well, fans down here. Jay, Emma, so Emma, I think we've got it going right about now. <laughs> I, uh, as Sorry. someone who, who ended up in Minnesota for college in Mankato, oh, I, yeah. know that, I know that frozen tundra up there. I, I, you know, I want to ask you if you know my friends who went to Mankato. Oh, Mankato. I went there and I uh, graduated in 99. Oh, so. then no. You wouldn't know yeah. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> oh, no. Old, no. Jason, I know. Uh, I'm like, yeah. wow, I'm getting gray. No, for, yeah. For I went to college us, after the Army, so it was like a little bit oh, later cool. on. Cool. For, for those of us who are very familiar with, you know, life around the Great Lakes, it drips off of every single page. Oh, and, my you gosh. Know, I'm a house yeah. divided. My husband's from Michigan, so, you know. Uh-oh. I get it. Um, well, it, I you, do. You feel it. You feel it in every page. Yeah, I, I've always thought my way in was that I always thought that the Midwest kind of got the short end of the stick in fiction. Everybody wants to have Caribbean treasure hunts, mm -hmm. and globe trotting, and even though the Blue R Sanction has those locales, I always want to make sure that I include my roots, just because it's a place that is not written about. A lot. And so when people read the Great Lakes Saga or the Sunrise Side Mysteries, and there's even a little bit of Michigan uh, in narrator. Uh, that's where mythical narrator Sean Frost is from. Um, it's just part of, I would say, my brand in that way, just because I really love where I grew up. Um, and it's it. a lot of people that go to the Great Lakes and they stand on the shore and they look and they're like, my gosh, if you blindfolded me and took it off, I would think I was on the ocean. Mm -hmm. you, you can't imagine the scale until you're actually there. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Do I miss shoveling right now? No. <laughs> Not at all. I'm, I'm by the pool having a margarita. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, you guys, I think we're going to have to have a part two. Maybe a little <laughs> bit more roundtable. Because I could talk about this all day long. But everybody, make sure you take out...
check out the blue hour sanction and Suzanne, I'm going to take your advice. I was doing it while we were on here. I was looking at audible. I'm looking at what is Scott break? I'm like, Oh my gosh. And then I'm also going to look up you and I just love finding new narrators. I love, I, I, you know, I feel like I'm part of the family, you know, I'm part of like this thing where like, when you're listening to it, it's just a nice escape. And like I said before, soothing, there's been a couple narrators out there who are very like i'm not going to name the books but sometimes when you listen to them you're like that character does not marry up with that voice yeah and you know that's one thing i do like about the michael connelly books now too is that they're using the actual titus welliver and and um oh god what's her name um christine i don't know you know but they're using the actual actors so now when you're watching the series and you're reading the book or you're listening to the books you're like oh that's pretty cool you know well, Jason, I would say this too, just as one last plug, because you're all, you're so generous with your podcast, not only uplifting members of the military and their families, but also thriller writers in general. So if you are an author watching this, um, I would say definitely think about hiring Suzanne Elise Freeman mm -hmm. um, to, to narrate your book, because there are not a lot of female protagonists. Um, in this very male dominated and, you know, aim at your books too. I, I love that you're getting in there, mixing it up and it, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want, I really want to highlight that as her author and friend, uh, even if I didn't know her, I would say the performance you, you've, you know, consider it. Uh, she'll do an amazing job. Thank you, Landon. Awesome. I, I love got this. A, I got a novella coming out, Suzanne. I'm going to be. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, you guys, we're um, we really appreciate it on the Protectors Podcast. Everybody, you know, Audible, Amazon, check them both out, and thank you all. <laughs>